Okay. Um, I was really hoping that the room is emptier than it is. Um, please do ask questions when I'm talking. I, I, I usually tend to assume that we all know stuff that not all of us do. And if you don't ask questions, I'll probably be finished in half an hour. Um, so interrupt me, ask questions, and um, ideally we will go home with something out of this talk. Um, so, um, who am I? Um, I, well, I did computer science, and then I worked in the industry a little bit, and then I did um, a little bit of more education in bioinformatics, doing mostly machine learning and mostly Python. And then I went back to the industry. Um, so there was this gap of quite a few years um, that I didn't realize it happened. Um, and then I came back, and now I work as a data science consultant somewhere here. And um, the questions that I had to answer were, okay, we have these customers, or usually you have these questions um, for which you develop some machine learning model. In, in academia, I would, I would train my models, I would design my models, and then I would test them on my test data, and then I would publish the results of my model on the test data, and then my model's gone. Um, but here, um, I, I, I had these situations that, okay, now I train my model, but I need to serve it in the system. I, I have maybe an app that sends requests on a REST API, for example, and needs that those responses in real time. Um, I couldn't use like batch processing because I really needed those responses in real time. Um, so I went around and asked a bunch of people and I didn't find any really good technology that could allow me not to change much in my codes, but still serve the, um, the production code and, and uh, the product that we have. Um, so after asking around, a little bit, I stumbled upon this pipeline I.O. thingy. And what, what's the idea? The idea, oh, by the way, th this talk, it's like tagged as experience in PyData, not because you need to know a bunch of Python and machine learning to understand the talk. It's because usually when you are a little bit experienced with Python and you're dealing with data, you come up with the questions um, that I didn't know how to answer. Um, so this is like, this talk is not much about Python, it's about now that we know Python, now that we know machine learning, how, ca how can we give that, save that in production? So you, um, this thing says, um, let's assume we have our scikit-learn pipeline, or we have our um, Spark ML, or the TensorFlow, um, now we want to save it. Um, how can we make that as easy as possible? It doesn't really do it as easy as it promises. But um, I thought, okay, uh, my naive thought, the first thought was, okay, I have, I have my, my model, I have it in memory, I develop a web server with Flask maybe, and then I put it behind um, a load balancer and then I serve. Is that, is that really a good solution or not? Um, I, I was hoping for something better. And then here, um, so some of these repositories that you can go and check out. Um, on GitHub, um, like one of, one of the repositories I have is pipeline docs that are my thoughts about this thing that will help you understand a little bit, gi gives a little bit of context because the documentation is lacking every now and then there. And I have these two links to two good talks by the main developer of Pipeline.io. Um, they're really good and they give you an overview of what this thing can do, but it doesn't really tell you how to make it happen. It assumes that you have your cluster and everything running and it shows you a bunch of codes that run. Um, I would like to cover that part before these talks. So after that you can, you can watch these talks and understand what you can do after. Um, Let me try. 
So here is conceptually what we have. You have some data coming, um, and then you, like, through some stream processing, you store it. Um, sometimes you real time want to update your models and deploy them immediately for the user to use them. You want to store them and do some batch processing, update your model in the background, and then deploy them. And um, this pipeline IO, this like this whole bunch of codes and Docker images um, sits in between these modules. So what is pipeline IO? It is um, a bunch of scripts that help you deploy your cluster. The Docker images, the, the, these modules that you can put on top of each other on your cluster to, to have this thing happening. Um, and a little bit of code that once you train your model, will serve your model. So let's go to the main repository. So here you have um, Flux Capacitor is the, the account. You have two main repositories, Pipeline and SourceML. In SourceML, you have example codes that you can use once you have your cluster. Pipeline is the repository which has the Docker files and everything that will create this thing happening for you. If I have internet. Hmm. Okay, what well it loads. Um, so what will happen in the background? We will, um, well, I don't know. Like, how many people here have worked with a Kubernetes cluster? Okay, how many people here really know what DevOps is? Okay, so there are a few, but not everybody. I didn't know what it is. Um, put it simply, let's, see, let's say we have a bunch of servers, um, in-house or on the cloud. Those are a bunch of virtual machines. Now we have a bunch of resources. We want something that will handle these resources for us, and we basically tell it, okay, I want this module too. I want this module to take these many resources, and it will handle, okay, where, on which machine I can put it. Um, I can tell um, this orchestrator um, that, okay, if, if one of these services is using this much, um, these many resources, like this much CPU, then scale it up. If it's not using it, scale it down. All of that goes into, um, the realm of having an orchestrator. You can have um, DCOS, you can have Kubernetes, you can have OpenShift. They have different attributes, they are, they are better or worse for different things. This one is now using Kubernetes, which is one of them. I have tried it on um, Amazon as well as Azure. Um, and okay, let's go to my script. If, but, but if this thing, if internet is not working, I can't really do much. Okay. Um, so here you see the different modules that this system will use. Um, a lot of them you might know, know of, heard of, a lot of them not. Um, one thing that I liked about this whole project is that, well, it's really under construction. Um, 
it, it goes, it, it is moving really quickly. But it also helped me learn which module is good for what. Um, it's not a really a closed system. And you, you will have to deal with these modules. So you, you, you kind of are forced to learn them a bit better. Here you have the documentation. It is not, if you go to the website, you're not necessarily directed to these documentation. So you need to know that the, the actual thing is happening in the wiki of the repository. And then you have the setup. What you need to do is you need to have, um, it gives you a Docker image which has the, the, the necessary tools to deploy your cluster. Um, you need that on your machine. Then you need to deploy the Kubernetes on a cloud of your choice. It can be in-house. And then you deploy pipeline IO on top of that cluster. Um, if you go through the documentation, this is like in the, in the pipeline docs repository that I had, I, I have compiled the commands that I use to like starting from getting the, the Docker image to the end that is working right now. But um, please be wary that um, the, the latest release doesn't necessarily work, it's buggy. That's why, for example, here, I'm not fetching the latest release of the, the, the Docker image, it's the master branch. Um, so you get it, you run it, and then if you want to deploy it on Amazon, you configure your client. I've done, I've done that. And now let's see, we can start from here. Um, what questions? Yes, good point. Better? More? Okay. Yes. Yes. It's This is the story. Here you have the script. But it, it is um, it is called something sh. Don't run it. Um, like copy paste one line, the one line, and see what's happening there. I actually haven't run the script as a whole. Um, so here. I say, um, how, how, okay, I want to deploy it on, on Amazon. Now, now, now it, this, this part is a little bit Amazon specific. I need to store the information about my cluster somewhere. Um, if you're dealing with Amazon, you, you can put it on, a, on S3 bucket. Um, so this is like the name. It, it just has to be something um, that's like whatever that, that is accepted by as a, like a DNS entry can be here. Like you can't, it can't end by dashes but um, it doesn't have to be a domain name. And then you need to, to handle your cluster, you need a domain or a subdomain. I didn't, I'm using a free service, HomeNet. You can get a free um, subdomain there. I registered Python-2. Now let's see what, how it works. Um, okay. I'm, Right now, I'm in my Docker. I am right. Let's make sure that I am. Yes, OK. So I set my environment variables. I'm going to use them later. Then you create your, your bucket. I've already done that, so I'm not running that one here. 
then you need to like somehow you need to find your your cluster on the internet so you need those dns entries uh, uh, quite a bunch of them um, on amazon you can create a root 53 hosted zone saying meaning that you tell amazon that okay handle this subdomain for me and all the subdomains of this subdomain and tell me what the ips are you create that you get um some name servers that you enter later in the place that you create your subdomains. So when you create that, then you come here and you say, okay, this, this Amazon thing is handle, handling it for me. And then all the requests get forwarded to Amazon. Uh, sorry, this is Pipeline, right? Nope, this is a free service oh, called okay. afraid.org. Okay. And you can create a whole bunch of subdomains yeah. of a whole bunch of domains. The only thing you do here is that you create an NS record um, and then you enter your name here. So ideally for your organization or for any organization that is like seriously deploying it for production, you would have a subdomain that you control and then you forward that to, 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 to the Amazon name service. So here, um, like if I say now, okay, I wanna like ask this server about PyData2 home net. Oh, sorry. It tells you that it is handled by this server. And then whatever I create for my cluster will be a subdomain of this thing. Um, so you, you do these lines, I've done that part too. Once you do this, then you will see that you have a new hosted zone. Here. It doesn't have much yet, but it will get filled up. Now I can create my cluster. This KOPS, so, so you have, when you deal with Kubernetes, you have um, kubectl and KOPS. KOPS is basically to create your clusters for you on the cloud, uh, especially if it's Amazon, it works best. Um, like on Microsoft, I had to use their GUI to create my cluster and then continue from there. And let's create it. I actually have created everything on a different region. WS configure. Mm, okay, I'll go back here then. Why not? What is happening? Does it have an A behind it? So here it does. Basically here you would have U central one A because this is the data center that you put your nodes on. Um, but the the bucket doesn't have to. That's why. I just have U Central one. Okay. 
and if you go to your this is like so if you go to see your virtual machines there you see the the regions that are valid one a Okay, um, um, I just tried, uh, my bucket is in, in Europe anyway, but I, I, I have a ready cluster just in case that this didn't work, which didn't, so I'll show you that. So once you, once you, you, you create that, then what you will see um, in your buckets is that, okay, um, you will have a bunch of config configuration files about your cluster. Now, once you have that, you can start editing and um, like making sure that the nodes are what you really need. So here, for example, I want at least 20, like 200 gigabytes of um, hard drive space there. Um, you can set the type of the, the, the node that you get. You can also do GPU. It's a work in progress, both in terms of pipeline IO and Kubernetes. Um, I don't have the GPU nodes here because um, I ran into some of the bugs that are still open on Kubernetes and I couldn't really do anything about that. Um, so you set your nodes um, and then you say, okay, update my cluster. When you say update my cluster, it just means that, okay, now check the configuration files that you have and make my cluster according to that configuration and spec. The first time you will see that you don't have any cluster, anything there, and your configuration says that you need something, it will create everything for you. Once you run this thing, then you will see a whole bunch of virtual machines being created um, according to the number of nodes and master nodes um, that you've decided on. The master nodes are the ones that the, the Kubernetes masters sit on, the, the nodes, the worker nodes are the ones that your jobs will be running on. So here I have two nodes and one master node. Um, when you do this, another thing that is happening is that now you are creating the, the subdomain for your cluster. Therefore, instead of those two that were there, you will see a bunch of these ones here. Um, they are mostly I can't close this. No. Um, they are mostly internal IPs. These are your uh, virtual private cloud IP addresses that you can't access from outside. But there is one which is public, and that's the API dot the, sub, uh, the domain that you had. Now you can access this one. Now that you have it there, you can say, um, OK, get me my notes. This actually talks to that API dot whatever you had and fetches the, the notes that um, are there on your cluster? Um, some so like some of the security checks fail if um, sometimes so you can like not not have it really secure especially because I don't really have um, proper certificates published for everything that is um, supposed to be secure there we, we disable that and then now now my um, Kubernetes cluster is ready now I can start putting my modules on top of that. Um, the first one is a dashboard that I can see my cluster in a better way. Um, you run that and then you can um, view what you have there. It also show you the user path to that dashboard. And then this cluster info will tell you what you have on your cluster that, that you can access. One of them is your dashboard. So now you have like 
it's getting a little bit better, you have your Kubernetes dashboard. Here it will be empty because you haven't really deployed anything. Um, not yet. Um, oh, I'm actually worried because this thing is supposed to be running, not waiting for anything. Ah, okay. So now, um, another module that I really like is um, this weave scope. You can, okay. You, you, but it's, so weave scope is pretty dangerous if you d um, expose it to public because whoever goes there can control your whole cluster. Um, that's why, so, so when you have your Kubernetes, you have like when you deploy something, you have your pods, which is this like the, the modular thing that like everything that need to be together for, for a service to work. And then you have your services that like expose those services to you. Here I'm, I'm only creating my, um, basically my, my pods. And then on my computer, I forward one of the ports to that thing um, to be able to see what's happening. And you see your cluster. So you see which nodes are, which pods are talking to each other. Um, you can see your deployments and replica sets. You can upscale them if there is too much load there and you want to manually do that. Um, and you can even, um, from, I think from the pods, you can see what's going on in there. You can, you can do all of these without weave scope. Um, it's just an, an easy, nice GUI. So now we also have this one. Now we deploy the pipeline IO. You say this is the, the, the latest version, which is not master. Um, and you run these two commands that will start creating a whole bunch of deployments on your Kubernetes cluster and create those services. Um, it is really important to know that these two are these two little files. They are nothing really fancy. They are, they, they basically just say, okay, um, this PIO command is like create. It can also be delete. Like, like you can say this, like this is the configuration for my pod, create this thing. You can also say, okay, delete this thing. You don't have to know what it was there. Um, and if you want to restart something, delete, create, then you come here and you're like, okay, I just want to, I don't need any Redis um, key value server there. You just delete that one or you don't create it. Um, some of these now that I will continue are, um, again, not the latest version or the master. Um, and here you have the services. So now once you do this one, this is when you come here and you see all your pods and services. And now you have your Spark, you have HDFS, you have, um, well, what do we have here? Um, you have your like prediction service. Um, you have a Jupyter hub. You have Turbine and Hystrix, um, like two of my favorites there. Um, and you have Airflow. So, okay, now we have our cluster. How do we um, how how do we deal with different versions of our machine learning modules now? You can either th these prediction servers expose an API for you that you can push your model to them and they will immediately start serving that model. You can version them if you have somebody using them. You say, okay, now I have version two, and then you change they, they they change the URL and they they immediately start changing. Uh, using the version two. If you want to do A-B testing, you, you push two different versions and then you do your A-B testing there. Um, the, it, they use, especially on the Java part, ah, okay, before that. My question, my original question was, um, how can I, like, was it like, was it a good idea to just um, put my um, web server in Python and put a load balancer behind that? One answer is no. Um, some other, some people answer to that question yes. People who say no go different paths. One of them is this JPML or PMML, which is a language for you to serialize your model. 
You can serialize your model from R, from Python, like the scikit-learn ones, um, or Spark ML. Once you serialize your model, then your model is there. Um, a different language can, uh, who, who can understand this file now can serve it. And then you have a Java slash Scala code which serves that model for you. This is a, so, so this part that, um, well, you s when you save your model, you're using these libraries, but the part that serves you the model using these files and the, the servers that expose those APIs for you for you to push the, the models are pipeline IO now. Um, So let's go through some of them and see how it looks. You may be able to access this one now under jupyterhub.pydata-1.homenet.org. Um, I have the Pardon? Uh, I, sorry again, but I, I'll, you'll, you'll see. So this, this one is exposed to you now. Um, I'll probably delete everything tonight, but you c now you can check it, and it probably won't work if everybody does. Um, but you will, so this is what you'll see. Again, when you deploy your own thing, you will see a bunch of these folders, but not source ML and this Adrian thingy. Um, these are old codes, don't work with the current servers. You need to use this, the, these codes, all the example codes that I mentioned are in a different repository under the same account as Flux Capacitor. They are source ML. So now, you have deployed your cluster, you are using these codes. And the ones that we'll be using mostly are things that are very close to the codes that you find here. You have examples for Spark, Scikit-Learn, like pure Python server, or PMML, and also TensorFlow. So let's go through some of them and see how it works. Do you know Jupyter Hub? That that part is not known, right? Okay. You know, you know. Yeah. This is just a like alpha version fans here. Well, first you need this package which uh, dumps your scikit-learn um, pipelines in PMML, and then let's have some dummy models. Fit my model. And after you fit your model, this is basically what you do. You, you dump your model in a PMML file, which looks like this. We have both. So um, here in Pipeline IO, you have the PMML server, which is a Java server, which uses <coughs> Hystrix and Turbine, which are like um, some Netflix, um, like Netflix uses them. They are really reliable, I really like them. But you also have the Python, pure Python server that you can um, pickle your scikit-learn and send it there. But in, in the case, of, so if, if I was using like GPy, like Gaussian process, I would probably use that. But if I was using scikit-learn, you can, you can dump your whole, whole scikit-learn pipeline in PMML. So you don't really have to do the Python way. So you can like, um, th this is, um, no, this is not, yeah, this is what it's doing. This is like a scikit-learn model and is uh, dumping it in, uh, in PMML. Um, 
So I have my file. The other thing that I need, I, you don't really need it, it just makes things easier. You have this uh, Python package, PIOCLI. Um, what you can do with it is, for example, you say, okay, I have this server. I want to deploy a PMML model in this namespace. This is my, the, the name of the model version one. And my model is located here. Oh, no. Okay. Now you say deploy it. It just, when you look at it, what it's doing is that it compresses the whole thing that you have in your folder and sends it to the server. Now a ser your server has a copy of your code and your model and everything you had there. So you better not have your data in that folder because then that would be large. Um, but you're sending everything, meaning that if you have different versions on your server, later on you can go back to your server and see, okay, this this model was this code was actually for this model. It's not it like that. It's no way a good way of version controlling your models, but um, just to keep track of, okay, what model was for which for for which code for now, it, it's a good solution. Um, and then you can use the same thing to get a prediction of your model. So you send it an input and you, then you get your output. Now you have it. You have your, you have your um, server which is serving your, your machine learning model via those APIs. You don't have to use it if you're writing a code. It's as easy as sending a request. You're sending a post request to that server. And it gives you the response. Um, and it's also pretty fast. I'm mean, not too bad. Let's send 2,000 requests. And then the other thing you have, if you use this PMML with a, like Hystrix on the back end, then you can see for each of your models that you've deployed, you can see um, how much load it's under. Okay, it took 11 seconds for those 2,000 ones. And here you'll see that, okay, my, my 99th percentile is 300 millisecond, but my 90th percentile is one millisecond. It was probably because at the beginning it was loading your model from the file. Um, okay. Questions until now? Maybe you'll come to that later, but uh, so um, I'm assuming you can't really abstract away all the like deployment. Uh, I'm assuming you can't really abstract away all the deployment stuff that's going on. So, for example, for instance, um, is there a fault tolerance in there, and how does the reg how does the registry for individual model instances work? Huh. That's one part of the question. Maybe I'll just put the other one right oh, after it. And you, ca you can choose. You okay. can choose which one to ask, or you can answer both if you want. And the other question is: um, Is there any component in there if you have two models, for example, predicting, you know, the same stuff, and you want to? You maybe you have two different, you know, aspects of it, and you have some sort of, um, let's say, um, strategy how to mix the results. Is stuff like that, you know, supported there at all, or is that something that's out of scope and you have to build something abstraction in front of it? So the second question, which is about using different models, is basically what you do in machine learning using ensemble methods. Uh, it does. It's not in the scope of Pipeline I/O. You do machine learning for that. Um, but for the first one, the reliability, scalability, and the deployment. This is not the preferred way in production for anybody because right now I could push, I basically did now, push the, the, the model on, on what I had on my server. I, over, I just overwrite my, my model on the server. So you don't really want to do that in production. What you want to do is that you 
you know, in software. So, so the problem with machine learning, like, or I think is the problem, is that the whole machine learning thing is maybe, I don't know, 10 to 20 years behind software development in terms of continuous integration and version control and all of that. So what you do here is that you would push, I would push my, my model into a repository and then use that repository to build a Docker image and then push that Docker image as a new service to your cluster. And then your production uh, environment uses these different services. And then if you don't like one of them, you just take them down and you have the, like you have basically the history of all the Docker images that you've had. And that's the, that's the, the main idea for um, having it in production. And that's like partially why the other service that you have in Pipeline IO there, which is like one of the modules that it uses is this um, Airflow. You can define processes in Airflow you can say, I can attach this process to a GitHub webhook. And then you say, okay, if something happens on this branch of this repository on GitHub, start creating my Docker image, then push it to the cluster and then have it ready and running. Um, and like the kind of code that you need to write for your Airflow, if it loads, is not that hard. This is like, it, this, this process would be one page of code. Um, you don't have to use this one. You can use your Jenkins because basically from now on, you have everything that you have in, in software development. You have your cluster, you have your repositories. You could use Jenkins to, to create your new images and push, push, push them in the cluster. Um, what, in terms of reliability, um, the one I like is um, that this Hystrix because you can configure it and say, okay, I really want my response time to be less than, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. And it doesn't wait for, for if you send the request to one of the workers and that worker is taking too much time, it just sends that same request to another one. Because the, pro the, the, the policy is here to, like, to get that result at least once and pretty quickly, not exactly once. It does, you don't really care if you end up sending the same request to two different workers. Um, and you can, um, again, that's like um, what you have when you have um, any orchestrator. You can set policies for if the, the CPU usage of this service is more than this, on all the nodes, just scale it up. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, so this is PMML. I like it. A lot of people don't. Um, now let's see if we can get is it inside PM? Okay, yeah, I like this one. This answers your question about Python. Um, So let's say now I have a really a custom model. It's like this is supposed to calculate the Z score for you. Um, and I don't have the, so, so once you have um, a code which is not supported by, by those PMML libraries, you have two ways to go. One is to write that thing for PMML yourself, like, be, like basically add to, like add to those PMML libraries. Okay, I want to be able to, to dump this model now extend that um, or you can just pickle your um, your model and then send it to the other server on pipeline IO which accepts just Python code and it's not the Java based one anymore okay now I have my file and then again to deploy it you just um, send it to a different server. So, so, so another thing, these services, um, you will, n you, you need to know where they are. These, these little URLs or server addresses that I'm using here, this is how you get them. Um, so what services do I have? A whole bunch of them. Um, tell me what like prediction Python is. One of the values there is your server address. And then you copy that 
into here to push your model there. And you deploy which, again, compresses everything you have and sends it to the server. Again, this, um, this PIO thingy is nothing really complicated. It is using those APIs. So you could just ignore all of that and have your own code, which is talking to that API endpoint, which is accepting the zipped files for your models. Um, something really useful there to, to understand how those servers are working is Where do we have the pipeline itself? In CLI, you have this PIO. And like you can say, okay, what happens? If I deploy and then which deploy is it? So this code is supposed to also in the future deploy, um, manage your cluster deployment. Um, and then you don't have to run those Kubernetes commands. But then in case of deploying a model, you'll see um, what API endpoint points of the server it's using. Okay, so we sent the model there. Now we can get it back. This is the output. And then you can see, okay, what happens? Again, you can you don't have to use that command line. And then you can see what happens if you send like a thousand ones. Not too bad. Um so this is now covering the PMML way and the just Python which are two different services. Now you can go and see, okay. Um, what about TensorFlow? Again, it's it like usual TensorFlow stuff. You train your model. Once you train your model, you send it to a server. This is the limit of um, this talk and pipeline I own now, because the you can on on the cluster I can train it, I can push it, and when you get the we want to get the prediction, the HTTP server on the server can talk to the um, the Google protocol, and there is a bug there. So I can train it and push it, and, but I can't get the predictions here. But the code is almost there. Like the, the server is almost there. Um, and you can see how it works. Questions? Pipeline IO? Um, It is, um, so the thing is, if you want, if you really want to um, have those modules that you have here on a Kubernetes cluster, it's not really that easy. You could do it. You have them here already. If you want to serve your models, that piece of code that is reading your dumps that, that you're sending to the server and is serving you on HTTP and giving you the predictions using the code that you sent to the server, that part is completely pipeline IO. Um, that is that is the part that 
you have in predictions. You have, okay, my JVM is the one that handles pipeline IO. But sorry, the PMML. And here you have evaluate PMML command. It basically reads the file and the input uses that model that you sent it, applies it on your input and gives you the output. Tornado. So Flask is much easier to use. But that that's again like what like at the beginning when I said like I, I learn a lot of stuff here is that Flask is not asynchronous, but it's really easy to to write uh, a piece of code using it and have your server immediately ready. But if you want to do um, like asynchronous stuff, then you use Tornado mm -hmm. and it uses that. Yeah. So so. Yeah, so you don't deploy new servers, you, you upscale your um, pod or your service, basically. So here, um, one of the services that you have is prediction Python 3. And then if I get its pod, you see that I have only one out of one that I've requested. You can upscale it and you can say, okay, I want three servers there. Then you have three. You can say, like dynamically scale it up and down. And if, you, if your whole cluster doesn't support it, like you don't have enough resources there, then you add a node. Then that's when you go, like, go back one step at the very beginning when I was defining my cluster before deploying Kubernetes on like on it. I said, okay, I want two worker nodes and one master node. You say, okay, I want now three worker nodes. I want four. And then after you do that, you say, okay, I want more of these pods on top of that. Um, like on, on a scale Sorry, from, uh, I have to force you, uh, I forgot what you said. Um, on a scale from like zero, you'd be totally crazy to run this to 10, IBM has been running this for 10 years successfully. Like, what do you think, where is this stuff? I don't know of any, any enterprise company running it. I know that there are beta users, and I know that for one of our customers will be adapting this for their uh, backend. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, so for that solution, I would like, use whatever I have here, and then I ha what I have to do is for an enterprise to have it, like they prefer to have it on OpenShift instead of Kubernetes. They want it to, ha to have it on Red Hat on, um, in instead of Debian, but I would use it. And then the, the other thing is that I, wouldn't, I won't be using all the services, so I can focus on fixing and making some of them very stable and then using them. Thing is, for, for, some, of th for some of them, the solutions that I see out there are pretty closed. Like TensorFlow says um, you can train stuff, and I also have TensorFlow serving, which is pretty reliable, but I have to do my stuff in TensorFlow. The other solutions are like that. Um, Apache Spark says that, okay, I have Spark ML. You can serve your uh, models there using micro batches. Um, you have these different solutions, but if I have a group of data scientists that are used to their Python, I couldn't really find any other solution that would serve them. Here, I just tell them whatever they want to do. They don't, so the, the, the other beauty is that they don't, your um, pr prediction, your serving cluster doesn't have to be the same as your training cluster. You can just have them on different ones. They're just dif these endpoints that they're talking to each other. They don't, you don't, they don't, y your data scientists don't even need to train their models on your cluster. They can train them on their machines and then at the end use this to push their models. Um, so I think I would use them but not all of it and it's not stable that's like like for example one one thing is that the the results that we saw from those servers um they are not even proper json doesn't matter doesn't load but but there is like there is a like for example there is a tiny bug that in the return values it's not that easy to handle JSON in like Scala or Java, then like that's not implemented yet. So these are really things that you need to know, but 
after that, there, it's like, it's, it's not, so the thing is, it's not much on top of the modules that you can rely on. I can rely on Turbine and Hystrix. I can rely on my Spark. I can rely on my HDFS. It's not, I can rely on a Kubernetes cluster. It, like, it's not much more than that. And the, the part that is developed by Pipeline IO developers is not that much. Thank you. Uh, one complication of running real-time prediction in production is, of course, uh, access to data. So as far as I understood, right now you're pushing the features in a JSON file, uh, so you're not accessing any outside storage. Is uh, Pipeline.io comes with any options already embedded, or it's up to me to connect it to either event streams like Kafka or uh, Kinesis, or to maybe a, a NoSQL database like Dynamo or Mongo? Does it help with Access of. Um, so, one is that um, if your prediction is just data, like key value, you want to know what are the top five choices of your users, um, you push that your, to your key value server and you fetch it from there instead of having a prediction and you use your pr machine learning model to create that for you every night, for example, or every hour, and you update that, and your production environment actually queries that database. But if your model needs real-time access to data for its prediction, then you need to um, go and modify those uh, prediction servers. What um, I would recommend, and I would like to use it for, is that that module that is uh, sending a request to, to my model to get a prediction, fetch all the data that it requires to get that prediction, sends it to my model, and then my model uses that information. Because your model is your trained model. Your, I mean, when you have like a support vector machine, when you have a neural network, you get your input and then you have your output. It's not that you're, you give, you say like, um, okay, my model, this is my image, classify this for me. Your model doesn't go query a database for you to be able to classify that image for you. If that is the case, if that's your use case, you need to modify um, those prediction servers. All right then. Thank you.